side for Vieira, who will play through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal, Gabriel Jesus to finish it off, oh what a way to do it, Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal, he's back and he's back with a bang, into the penalty area it goes, Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net, Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another live edition. No, sorry, it's not a live edition. It's a pre-recorded edition. I've messed it up already. Of the Chronicles of a Guna podcast. Part of, of course, the 90-min football family with me, your host, Harry Simeon. On this episode, we're going to look back on that draw with Bayern at Emirates Stadium last night. What does it mean in terms of the overall tie? Was it a fair result? Should Arsenal come away from that with some regret? Could Arsenal have done better? Should they have taken some kind of lead with them going into the second leg next week? We're going to break all of that down. We're going to talk Arteta's team selection. We're going to talk substitutions. We're going to talk about the controversial moments that continue to be discussed um, of course, uh, ever since the game uh, came to a close last night, we've got loads and loads to get into. and I can't wait. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already and you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you uh, haven't left a like on the video, what are you playing at? Get on with it. If you're listening to us on audio as well, then please do uh, subscribe and leave us a review. It really, really does help. I'm recording this at the crack of dawn. The birds are singing um, because I've got Loads and loads i got to do today. So I'm going to be traveling into London shortly after I record this. So I just wanted to make sure that we got this out to you guys uh, nice and early. Remember, it is a pre-recorded edition, so I won't be able to react to your comments live as they're coming through. But I will be checking them throughout the day. So please do leave your comments below. Let's start off then um, with the kind of build up to the game. Um, you know, it was the first time in a long old time that we had that kind of occasion at the Emirates Stadium, a Champions League quarterfinal. Everybody was buzzing. And the fact that there were no Bayern fans allowed in the ground, although I did spot a few that were ejected once Bayern scored and they kind of couldn't keep their emotions intact and they revealed themselves. I did see a, a few of them um, sort of get noticed by Arsenal fans who obviously then pointed them out to stewards and the stewards had to come in and and, and take the, the awkward step of removing those guys. Um, but the atmosphere around the place was incredible. Um, you know, there was talk of some kind of security threat in the build up to the game, which I think led to increased security, which probably contributed to why everything felt so crowded sort of outside the stadium where the armory is, where the little mini roundabout is. It was packed even an hour and a half before kickoff. It took me quite a while to get into my seat as well. I was back in the North Bank for the first time in a long time. I really enjoyed it. Good to catch up with, um, you know, some friends and stuff and, and to be on that side of it rather than having to stay semi-professional uh, throughout a really, really emotional game. The Ashburton Army were great in the lead up to the game. They marched down um, under the bridge uh, coming from the direction of the Tollington and made their way towards the Emirates Stadium and did a great job of creating a cracking atmosphere. When we got in the ground, you know, North London forever was ringing around the place and the Champions League anthem, which I don't know about you, always gets me going. It just felt like a really, really good special occasion. And I thought Arsenal, you know, did did well enough to obviously stay in the tie despite giving a couple of really cheap goals away. But I do think there'll be a sense of regret coming away from that match with regards to the nature of those goals we conceded. And we'll break them down in a little bit more detail in just a second. But I do want to start off by talking about Mikel Arteta's team selection, because for me, I think you can say that maybe he got it wrong. We talked in the build up to the game about how I'd quite like to see Takahiro Tomiyasu come in at left back. And that was because I know what a threat Leroy Sane is. We needed somebody who was going to be quicker across the ground, who was going to be more physical, who was going to be more difficult to drop a ball over the top of, who was more comfortable turning and sprinting back towards his own goal. And I think that Takahiro Tomiyasu is more that than Jakub Kivior. 
What I will say in Mikel Arteta's defence, and I know it's very easy for me to sit here in the aftermath and having looked at a player who struggled and saying, well, he shouldn't have started and actually the player that I said should have started should have been the one. What I will say in Mikel Arteta's defence is that when Tommy Asu has come on in recent weeks, he's not looked at 100%. Now, only Mikel Arteta, the staff, and Tommy Asu himself know exactly where his fitness is at. But you you think about what Tommy Asu's skill set is, and it's impossible to think that that wouldn't have given us a greater chance of defending the threat of Leroy Sane that caused us, of course, some problems in the first period. Kivior, though, has been in good form. Kivior has been playing really, really well. And I think there have been a couple of games where he's looked like he's not a left back, which is the truth of it. Like you, you can talk about him doing really well and, and he has and he's improved and he's come on leaps and bounds, but the guy's not a left back. And I think against the very best opposition, we saw it against Manchester City a little bit as well. Against the very best opposition, that becomes exposed. And so I think in those games, Mikel Arteta needs to do something different. He didn't this time. He went with Kivior at left back. He also continued with Jorginho in midfield. And I had said that I felt it was time to bring Thomas Partey back in. And I thought that the fact that he didn't, um, you know, he didn't start or, or, or come and play a big part against Brighton was because he was being saved for this game. And I'd have loved to have seen uh, that sort of Partey, Rice, double pivot thing um, with Martin Odegaard sort of being let off the leash a little bit in order to go and roam and do the things that he does really, really well. But we didn't see that. And again, a bit like the Man City game, I felt like Jorginho at times struggled. I think at times he, he, he was very composed and calm in possession, which we know he, he's got and we know he can do. But I thought there were times where the game maybe bypassed him a little bit. And again, it's about horses for courses. It's not to say that Jorginho isn't a good player and isn't useful in certain scenarios and in certain games. But I think it is about horses for courses. And I think this is where Mikel Arteta is still learning as a manager. I think he's got a lot better. But I think this is one of the areas in which, you know, maybe there needs to be a, a little bit of improvement still. But again, I'll caveat that with the point of how fit was Thomas Partey? I don't know. Because he too has looked rusty. He looked quite good, I thought, for the first 45 minutes against Luton. But after that, um, you know, he seemed to he seemed to drop off. That's why he was replaced. Look, Luton and Bayern Munich are two completely different sides and the, the gap in quality between the two is seismic. So I'm not saying that because Partey played OK in 45 minutes against Luton, um, you know, that means he was ready for this game. And again, only the club will know. But that those two players, Partey and Tommy Asu, are two players I'd have quite liked to have seen from the start yesterday, we didn't see that. Then comes the opening goal. And, you know, look, it's bad defending from Bayern in a lot of ways. I think when you look at the build-up to that goal, it's pretty poor. Um, you know, White's involved, Havertz is involved. Um, and when they work the ball uh, into Saka, he just lets it run across his body. The space opens up. He spots the, the far corner and he just sort of bends it into the bottom corner. Manuel Neuer with no chance. Brilliant finish from Bukayo Saka. And the place was rocking. We had Bayern at that point up against the ropes. We had the bit between our teeth and it felt like we were going to then go on and, and make it a real comprehensive victory and potentially put ourselves out of sight ahead of the second leg. The Ben White chance then comes along, which is a glorious opportunity. And Mikel Arteta said this was the moment of the match. And I don't blame him for saying that or thinking that or feeling that. From my position in the North Bank, it didn't look as good a chance as it actually was. Because when you are um, when you are behind the play, you it's very difficult, particularly at that end of the pitch, from my position anyway, to judge distances between the player and the goal. And it seemed to me like Ben White was a lot closer to the goal. And that meant that there was a lot less of an angle to go across it. And that's why he tried to maybe give Manuel Neuer the eyes and try and catch him out. When I've seen it back, when I watched the replay, I realised actually Ben White was a bit further back from goal than I'd initially thought. And that he certainly had the angle to put his laces through it and go across the goal. And it's, it's a big old chance. But look, Ben White's not the person that you want that opportunity to fall to. 
And I know you can't pick and choose who gets into those positions, right? The reason that Ben White gets there is because probably Bayern's attentions are on other players. But for me, you got to do better. you got to at least force Manuel Neuer into a half-decent save. In the end, you've literally passed it to him. And I don't remember at that particular moment thinking, oh, you know, this is a, a big sort of sliding doors moment. This could be massive in the tie. Because I thought at that point we were playing really, really well. And we looked really, really comfortable and dominant. But looking back on it, it is a big moment. And it is a moment in which we could have put Bayern to bed and we could have ended up, um, you know, going to Munich next time around with a really comfortable and commanding lead. Because at 2-0, you can play a different game. You can be the ones that sit off a little bit and um, and try and lure them out. And then you can use your counter-attacking threat, which we have, um, given the players that we had on the pitch. It, it, it wasn't to be. The goals that we then went on to concede, I think, had the potential to be massively damaging. And although I'm disappointed that having taken the lead and having played well in spells, we didn't win the game. I do look at those moments and I think... If two of those moments come along in one game, and let's be honest, we haven't seen many of those defensive lapses from Arsenal in 2024. But if two of those moments come along at once in the same game on a big occasion like that, and you don't allow it to define you, it doesn't force you to crumble. And you're able to find a way to at least make sure that you don't lose the game. I want to look at that from a kind of glass half full perspective, because I think that is a sign that Arsenal have stepped forward but I do think that looking at the way everything unfolded last night, we still have a lot to learn at this level and in this competition. And people, I remember in the comments section when I did the Bayern preview pod, were going, what's the matter with you? Why are you talking up Bayern? They're rubbish. They're useless. They're 16 points behind Bayer Leverkusen in the Bundesliga. Why don't you have confidence? Why don't you have belief in our team? It's not just about our team. I believe that this team have progressed. I have confidence that this team are moving in the right direction and are getting better and better and better. But I also respect teams that are full and stacked with individual talent. Just on that Bayern side, that front three of Sane, Gnabry and Kane is brilliant. It is brilliant. I thought Leon Goretzka in midfield was fantastic. I thought Joshua Kimmich, who we've been linked with, of course, was very, very good and comfortable at right back. You know, I, I looked at that Bayern team. You know, Alfonso Davis had a few moments against Bukayo Saka where he struggled, but he's got that incredible recovery pace. And we saw him use that to get himself out of trouble at times as well. Manuel Neuer has been one of the best goalkeepers in world football for the last 15 years. You know, there's a lot of talent in that team. as a very experienced manager in the dugout. And this idea that we were going to turn up and roll Bayern over without them swinging any punches back. Um, uh, you know, and, and obviously they landed a couple in the end. But to think that that was going to be the case, I think is naive. Manchester City have been dominant in English football for a long, long time. But it took them until last year to crack the code of the Champions League. It's not easy. And I think people need to remember that. And maybe what happened last night is a bit of a reality check for some of the supporters. Let's talk about... The first goal, the Gnabry goal, um, I thought the defending for this was just poor all round. To let Gnabry get across um, Ben White the way he did. And, and maybe I'm being a bit harsh because Ben White does stay goal side, which is where he needs to be. But I felt like he was maybe a little bit too slow to react to Gnabry making that run from outside to in. And I talked about this, didn't I? In the preview show, I talked about Harry Kane's movement and how he might not always be the one on the ball. And he might not always be the one playing the pass, but some of his runs, they open corridors for wingers. They open the door for the likes of Gnabry and Leroy Sané to come in field. And both of them did that to devastating effect on different occasions last night. But this goal all comes about because of a bit of panic at the back caused by, in my opinion, David Raya. Now, I, I like David Raya and I think that he has got better and better and better. And I think, in fact, you could argue that since the turn of the year, he's been as close to immaculate as is realistically possible. But his decision yesterday to push up as high as he did, it just caused panic and chaos at the back. And Gabriel receives the ball and, and you could see it. Gabriel looks over his shoulder and he's expecting his goalkeeper 
to have actually dropped off and provided him with an angle so that he can roll the ball back and Arsenal can build up again and, and he can use the player that is facing forwards, the player that can see the whole picture in front of him. Gabriel looks over his shoulder, realises that David Raya isn't there and has to turn back. Now, I still think the way we gave the ball away after that was too cheap. And I still think that you could do better in Gabriel's situation and, and, and you know, in terms of the way everybody else defended that particular piece of play. But I think it all comes about because the goalkeeper's just got sucked in too high. Now, I understand that he's asked to play that role. He's asked to play like a bit of a sweeper keeper. And on a lot of occasions, that's helped us. But you have to get it right. And in these big, big games against the very best opposition, you make a mistake most of the time, you'll probably get punished for it. And that was a really, really cheap goal to concede. Not long after that, of course, Arsenal give away a penalty kick. Um, Leroy Sane receives the ball wide right for Bayern, our left. And the way he wriggles away from Kivio, for me, is just too easy. Um, the way he spins him, the way he turns him. And once Leroy Sane gets his head down and starts going, he's very, very difficult to stop. Incredible dribbler. Really, really good close control. For me, he should have been taken out before he gets into the box. Jorginho tried. Um, someone else tried before that. Gabriel comes across. And in the end, um, you know, as Ben White comes across to try and shut the door, it's William Saliba that makes a slight bit of contact with Leroy Sane, who seems to kind of kick his own leg and then goes down. Look, it's a penalty for me because when somebody is running at that speed and you clip them, it is a foul. Um, and it was enough to knock Sane off his feet. I don't know why Sane would have gone down and it not been uh, for the contact. And of course, as seems to be written every time this guy turns up at the Emirates Stadium, Harry Kane converts from the spot. Now, I really feared for Arsenal at that point. I really, really did because I looked at it and I thought, we've not played very well since um, the sort of the, the Ben White missed opportunity. We've made two mistakes, in my opinion, at the back. And what kind of impact is that going to have on our confidence? We're facing a side that, as I kept saying in the build-up, have been there and done it. They've got the T-shirt, have, uh, have competed in Europe's Premier Competition in the latter stages many, many times before. There's a lot of players in there that know what it's like, that have been there, that have done it. And as I keep saying, Bayern might be struggling in the Bundesliga in comparison to what we've come to expect from them over the years. But this is still a very, very good and very talented side. And I feared for us at that point. We go in at the break and it's all a bit nervous and it's all a bit of a worry. Um, and then Mikel Arteta makes a change at half time that I think made a lot of difference. But it wasn't without its risks. So at the break, Mikel Arteta decided to take Jakub Kivio off and bring on Oleksandr Zinchenko. And... You know, at the time I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, you have just watched Leroy Sane rip our fullback to shreds. So you've somehow managed to find the only other guy in our squad that looks less comfortable when it comes to the defensive side of playing left back and brought him on the pitch. In my head at half time, it was if you're going to make a change at left back, it's got to be Tommy Asu. But Mikel Arteta didn't do that. He went with Alexander Zinchenko. He took the gamble. He said to himself, Mikel Arteta, I am behind. We are trailing. I need a bit more control in midfield because I thought up until that point, by the way, which I probably should have mentioned earlier, I didn't think we were very good at controlling the midfield. I think Mikel Arteta felt that he needed more control. He needed a bit more creativity from deep and that Zinchenko was going to offer that. But he must have been slightly concerned by Zinchenko defensively and um, and the fact that, you know, Leroy Sane had given Kivi or a much better one-on-one -on -one defender such a hard time. What was that going to mean against Zinchenko? But we took the gamble and we took the risk anyway. And, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but Mikel Arteta got that right because it did make a difference at points in the second half, especially at the start of it. Did we create as many clear-cut chances as I'd have liked in the second half? No, but we seem to have a little bit more control. And thankfully, the Sane um, effect was reduced, but not because of, uh, you know, Zinchenko being a better one-on-one -on -one defender than Kivio, just because we had a lot more of the ball and we seemed to be able to protect ourselves against the transition a bit more because the midfield could help out 
Zinchenko's runs were facilitated by those around him. The spaces that he drifted into were facilitated by those around him. And Big Gabby shifted across a little bit uh, to try and help us deal with that. A little bit later on in the game, Mikel Arteta brought on Gabriel Jesus and Leandro Trossard, who combined for the equaliser. Um, I said it last week, Leandro Trossard, best finisher at Arsenal, stick by that. Gabriel Jesus, for me, made such an impact. Such an impact. Now, I've looked at him recently and thought, not quite the same player, not at the same level that he showed at points last season. But it was quite clear, I thought, as the game went on, that we needed somebody who was a better dribbler, who was going to get on the ball and cause chaos and attract bodies in towards him with the quick feet, with the changing of direction, with the shifting. And he looked a lot sharper. Now, I know he didn't start the game, but in the time that he was on the pitch, I thought he looked incredibly sharp, Gabriel Jesus. And it was his brilliant footwork that opened up the opportunity for Trossard, who dispatched it, obviously, expertly. It felt like as the game went on, and again, it's hindsight and it's easy to say this, but it felt like it wasn't the game for Kai Havertz. Um, I know Mikel Arteta left him on the pitch, dropped him into a deeper position because we were chasing a goal, knowing that he'd make those runs into the box and all the rest of it. Is it harsh to say that Jesus should have started? Well, when you look at how Jesus has performed in the Champions League this season, you can understand why there were some people making that case. And I think as time went on, you could see that this wasn't the game for Havertz and it was a game more suited to Gabriel Jesus. But I don't want to... I don't want to go in too hard on Arteta for that because A, I'm talking with hindsight, which is easy, but B, Kai Havertz has been in immaculate form lately, man. Like he's just scoring goals. He's contributing in so many different ways. He's helping us go long when we need to. He's helping us by dropping into deeper pockets and opening space for others. His all-round game has been so good. You can understand why Mikel wanted to persist with him. At 2-2, I was content. Now, you could feel inside the stadium, and as you'd expect, that the fans were desperate to see Arsenal go on and try and win the game. But for me, it was very much about you've taken a lead, everybody's buzzing, then it's all gone flat because you've given away, you've gifted them two cheap goals. Now, it's about damage control, and it's about making sure that you're in the tie going into the second leg. Because defeat at the Emirates... It wouldn't have been impossible to turn around, but I think it would have been a really tall order to ask this Arsenal team to go there and have to come from behind. So I felt like I was content when we made it 2-2, gave it a little fist pump, wasn't going as crazy as everybody else and was just focused on hopefully seeing Arsenal, you know, see that out. Obviously, Bayern hit the post late on in the game, um, a really, really nervous moment and uh, a moment that, you know, um, I'm I'm glad went our way. But then there was a big call in the latter stages of the game. In fact, I think about 94 minutes in that didn't go our way. And that was the decision not to award Bukayo Saka a penalty kick after his coming together with Manuel Neuer. Now, when I was in the stadium and I was sitting behind the goal and my eyes opened up and lit up as I saw Bukayo Saka racing into that position, I was adamant adamant that Manuel Neuer had come out, got it horribly wrong and brought Bukayo Saka down. And I couldn't believe when I saw the referee waving it away. Then I thought to myself, but there's VAR. So relax. I'm sure they're going to pick this up. It looked stonewall. Um, it looked like a certain penalty. The referee then blew the final whistle. He stood there for a bit and then he blew the final whistle. And inside the stadium, I don't think we really figured out what was going on at that point. You know, people were looking at it going, is this a VAR check or is he blowing the full-time whistle? Then he does the hand signal to say the game's over. And we're all kind of like, what? What on earth is going on here? That is a blatant, blatant penalty. But Kyo Saka's reaction as well, I think, contributed to that feeling because A, he stayed down for ages once he was caught. And B, he then sort of, in a really sort of frustrated and angry way, almost Thierry Henry style, approached the referee to kind of say his piece and make his point about that decision. As soon as I got out of the ground, a friend of mine had sent me a video of it. And another friend of mine who was working in the press box had texted me saying, probably not a penalty. Obviously, they have the benefit of the screens. There were no replays being shown in the Emirates last night. We saw the goals and that was it. Um, 
But I kind of came out of the stadium less frustrated than maybe most because I'd been told by somebody that I trust and I'd obviously seen the video on my phone. And 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 I've got to be honest, look, I'd love to sit here and say that we were robbed and that's the reason that we didn't win the game. And, you know, sometimes you need someone or something to blame for not getting the result that you desired. But I don't think it's a penalty kick. I've got to be honest, like... I know this is going to be unpopular. This is going to go down like a lead balloon. I know there'll be loads of you screaming it back at your headphones or, or commenting in the chat saying, what are you talking about? That was a stonewall blatant penalty. I don't think it was. I think that Bukayo Saka dangles out the right leg in a really kind of unnatural way in order to try and engineer the contact. Now, I'm not subscribing to this idea that Bukayo Saka should be punished and that there should be retrospective action taken, which is some of the stuff that I was hearing on the radio this morning. I don't subscribe to any of that. I think it's a player doing what most players do nowadays, which is when they can anticipate contact, leaving a leg in, in order to try and make sure that that collision happens in order to win the spot kick. The thing I can't get my head around and you know, it's easy to say when you've had loads of time to watch it back over and over again. And it's very, very difficult to kind of judge someone for maybe a split second decision. But the thing I can't get my head around is why does Bukayo Saka leave the leg in and why is he not focused on just taking it around Manuel Neuer? Because he's done that pretty much. And it's only his dangling right leg that he has left there that has prevented him from coming out the other side of that and putting the ball into an empty net. So I am a little bit frustrated with the fact that he didn't he didn't convert the chance because I don't think the contact has to happen. I think that Saka is nimble enough and sharp enough to sidestep that. But he opts for leaving the leg in. There is a coming together. There is a collision. Um, I'm not saying that Saka faked the contact. There is contact. But is it enough? Well, first of all, it's not just about contact, is it? It's a contact sport. You don't give a foul automatically every time there's contact. What I will say is that Manuel Neuer does come running out towards the ball, but he seems to withdraw from making any sort of challenge. And it's just a coming together because Saka's left his leg there. So as much as it kills me to say, and as much as I'd love to sit there and say, we were robbed, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't think that was the case, if I'm being completely honest. Um, and I've got to be honest. A lot of talk about... Um, the uh, the penalty that maybe Bayern should have had, where Raya played the ball to Gabriel, uh, according to Bayern, the ball was live at that point, and Gabriel puts his hands on the ball. Um, look, Arsenal always do that, the restart where, you know, the centre-back sometimes puts the ball down and rolls it to the keeper, and then the team pushes up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Thomas Tuchel argued that the referee had said it was a kid's mistake, and he didn't want to give a penalty for that in a Champions League quarterfinal. And you know what? I think he's right. I think he's right. I think it's obvious that Gabriel didn't realise the ball was live. Um, you know, and the referees accepting of the fact that maybe they didn't hear the whistle or maybe they were changing the routine from the goal kick. And I think the referee, you know, maybe hasn't followed the letter of the law there, but what he's done is apply some common sense. And I quite like that. I quite like that. So I'm not going to sit and, and, and criticise the referee. I thought for someone who was taking charge of, I believe, his first knockout game in the Champions League. I thought he'd done all right. I thought he had a good game. I didn't have too many complaints. Um, the, the style of European refereeing uh, and the kind of bar with regards to what's allowed to pass and what's not is very different to what we're used to in the Premier League. And I accept that and I understand that. And I have that context planted in my mind when we go into these games. So I'm not going to sit there and pull his performance apart. I thought he got the two big decisions, the ones that I've mentioned, actually right. So, um, yeah, no complaints there. It's the halfway point. It's 2-2. Two -two. We go to Munich and it's a straight-up shootout uh, for a place in the semi-finals of the Champions League. I do want to talk about a few individual performances. I thought, you know, running through the team just, just very quickly to wrap up. Raya, you know, he brought that bit of panic, didn't he? Um, you know, in the build-up to the first goal, and, and you can't afford to do that at the highest level. I thought Saliba was incredible last night, with the exception of giving away the penalty. But, you know, he's got to try and do something there. Um, I thought Ben White was really good, apart from missing the chance. I thought generally his game was very strong. In midfield, I think that's where our problem was. 
to be honest with you. I think that's where we struggled at times. I thought Leon Goretzka in there with Lima alongside him were just were fantastic. They were really, really good. Um, they controlled the game. They had the, the mobility to get around the park and be pretty much everywhere. They were really good at working the ball out wide nice and early when Bayern uh, won those turnovers in possession. And I didn't think our midfielders were at the top of their game. I've talked about Jorginho already. I thought that the game maybe bypassed him a little bit. But I also have to say, I don't think Declan Rice had a good game last night. And, you know, that's not to stick the boot in on Rice. I think he's been brilliant 99.9% .9 of the time he's played for Arsenal. But he had an off night last night for me. I don't know if it was about, um, you know, maybe being tired. He's played a lot of football. I don't know if it was because he was moved into a slightly different position to accommodate Jorginho being in the team. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but he just, he, he wasn't at the races for me. Havertz was a little bit quiet. Um, Martinelli was very, very quiet. But I thought our left-hand side, generally speaking, was significantly weaker than the right. And although you can put some of that on Martinelli, I think the fact that he's playing with a different left-back all the time is not helping him. And the fact that we're playing where... Um, you know, we're rotating the left eight a little bit. Sometimes it's Rice in that position. Sometimes it's Jorginho in that position. Um, you know, we've seen Kai Havertz play there at times as well. Sometimes it's been Emil Smith-Rowe. I think the problem is, is that there isn't that continuity on that side that you have on the right. The right-hand side, it's White, it's Saka, and you know that Odegaard's going to go and join in with them. Last year, we had that continuity on the left with um, with Jacker combining with Martinelli and each each of them knew where each other was going to be and that relationship saw them both prosper I don't think you're seeing that this time around and I think the lack of continuity on that side is having an impact on Martinelli Trossard you know got the goal when he came on you know that's what Leo does um the most goals um from the bench across Europe's top five leagues that's the the stat that Leandro Trossard will be proud of at the moment and Mikel Arteta will be proud of as well because he's using him at the right time um, and he's impacting games. Jesus was excellent when he came on. I think for me, overriding feeling before I sort of sign out is if you can't win, don't lose. And we said that after the Man City game as well. And that's the difference between this Arsenal team and Arsenal teams of years gone by. In a one-off game in Munich, we're capable. I don't think there's any question about that. But I do think now because of the fact that we weren't able to establish some kind of lead to take there. There's a strong case to say that Bayern are the slight favourites now. I don't care what they do in the Bundesliga. I don't care about the fact that they're 16 points behind Bayer Leverkusen. When their team came out last night, I looked at it and I went, bloody hell, this is a good side. With the exception of maybe one or two weak links, it's a very, very good, strong, competent side. And to go away from home is going to be difficult. Um, but we're good enough, we're capable, and as long as we keep learning from the issues that we're facing, we're not at the point of perfection yet. I don't think perfection in football is is ever really achievable. I think you can get close to it, and I think we've seen teams over the years that have been close to it, but to get to perfection is a big ask. And we've seen great Premier League sides take a while to get their hands on old big ears, the, the Champions League trophy, because... It's something very different. You come up against different opposition. You come up against different challenges. And I'm not going to be, you know, losing sleep over it if, you know, we fall slightly short in this competition. I want us to get past Bayern because I think we're good enough. And I think we are the better side. But it's not just about talent at this point. It's about experience. It's about know-how. It's about being streetwise. And I think that's where we still maybe lack a little bit. We've got better, but it's where we lack in comparison to some of these European giants, shall we say. Look, we'll be back with another pod, uh, of course, on Thursday, and we will um, perhaps continue reacting to this game. Uh, maybe we'll do a bit of deeper analysis on it, uh, and then we're going to shift our attention on Friday, of course, to that game against Aston Villa in the Premier League at the weekend, which is massive. Uh, we need to regroup, recover, and go again. Thank you uh, for all tuning in. Again, apologies, it's a recorded edition, but... I want to get these out to you in a timely manner, which will mean from time to time uh, that we have to pre-record them. Uh, don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments and I'll pick those up and we'll touch on them on the next episode. Don't forget to like the video if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back very, very soon with more. Until the next time, take care of yourselves.